I believe I, there we go. Okay. Um, well, I'll start, I don't know if that first part got recorded. So welcome everybody to the January, 2022 open mic. This is the, I guess, second longest tradition in the Poetry Society's history. The open mics go back to 1985. So what's that, 35 years ago? Um, and uh, this has been a fun component of the Poetry Society for all that time. And um, this, uh, this is uh, the very, this is the second January in a row where our plans to celebrate our 100th anniversary have been ruined by COVID. When a year ago, we were, we were planning, well, two years ago, we were planning that January 2021 was going to be our big um, anniversary party. And of course, that had to be uh, postponed, we thought, uh, for uh, COVID. And then we thought, well, we, we certainly have it January 2022. And here we are with a, another giant wave that made us not only not be able to have the gala, but not even be able to meet at the Library Society, society where we wanted to. So I, this year I'm calling the open, the, the uh, open mic night, the Omicron mic night. Um, one, I have just a few announcements before we get started. The, um, the contest uh, admission period or submission period begins tomorrow, our, um, our spring contest, uh, tomorrow, January 15th to February 15th, I believe. And so we got a whole bunch more money up for grabs and fame and, um, and the ability to get your poem in the yearbook. So I hope you enter the contest. And on Monday, there's a special, a brand new thing that um, Evelyn Berry is putting on. It's called a, a, a salon for discussing modern poetry. And if you look in the most recent newsletter, there is um, there's information about how to how to get involved in that. Uh, it's it's also a Zoom meeting. So, well, without further ado, um, I would like to thank everybody. Oh, and if you weren't here earlier, I did mention we had uh, not as many people as I'd wanted for the open mic. So it, we will be taking when we get through the list, we'll take a few more. We'll just go an hour and. And if we can't make it to an hour, then we stop then, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll stop taking uh, participants when an hour is up, so. But um, I, what I did, the, the order, well, the order was in the chat room, I guess you can page up. Uh, it, it's pretty much the order in which I received people's emails saying they wanted to participate. So that's, the order is, is random only in that respect. Um, and we are going to start with Tracy Neal. She has been participating in the contest that we have every single month, which is the newsletter prompt contest, and she's a regular participant. So, um, Tracy, it is your turn. Start us off. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. So yes. my poem is called Hiding Behind the Corner. I used to be the girl hiding behind the corner. I felt like a loner. Yet even when I cried, I thought I had died to a world I had to face, but still the people lied. I must admit I couldn't take it. I truly believed I wouldn't make it. Then one day, something inside this vessel said, don't fake it, but break it. So I broke the walls that were tearing me apart and ripping out my heart until the fall I was about to hit came into a line for start. I just kept running since I couldn't stop. I ran like a criminal trying to get away from the cops. I got rid of the haters, the perpetrators, the two facers, and the instigators. I changed my way of thinking and didn't mind blinking. If times were too hard, I wouldn't stack it up with those deck of cards. I became stronger, could stand longer, not trying to measure up to a world going under. I gained respect 
and advance my intellect to a place I didn't expect. Now I can walk up to a person untimid and shy. I'm a newfound eagle and I'm ready to fly. I have to speak before my spirit leagues with anticipation, determination, imagination, and an accepted application. No, I'm not always accepted by those around me, but my soul has life that a blind person can see. I have a voice that needs to be spread in order to have true peace in my head. My spirit creates a difference in the essence of the confident presence I show when I decided not to be led. Thank you. Well, Tracy, thank you for that. That's great. Um, I really enjoyed it. it. And you know, that's one of the one of the things that's a real pity about doing this virtually is that if we were in person doing this, you would. Yeah. And um, so our next reader is Eugene Platt. He is, I, I guess at this point, the longest uh, serving, the longest running uh, member of the Poetry Society uh, at this time. So um, he's been active in the Poetry Society since the 1960s. Uh, Eugene, uh, looking forward to hearing your poem. You're gonna have to unmute. Uh, Eugene, you have to unmute yourself. You've done it, yes, good. Uh, yeah, I will read a poem that appears in the new issue of Constellations, a, a very attractive literary journal. It is titled, How I Escaped the Holocaust, and is occasioned by an Ancestry.com DNA test I took last year. It is dedicated in memory of the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. Until age 82, I never knew I was a half Jew. Until age 82 and seduced into producing a vial of saliva for trendy DNA testing, truly, I thought I was purely one of the unchosen. As a young American soldier after World War II wound down, I found myself stationed in Munich, the beautiful capital of Alpine Bavaria. Due to my newly discovered ethnicity, had I been born in that ancient city, I might have died in nearby Dachau or been boxcarred to faraway ostrich to slave away day after day after day, subsisting on watery gruel or maggoty mush until it was my turn to be gassed and burned to fervor the Fuhrer's satanic final solution. Phew, although born in 1939, the fateful year, the hateful despots, legions, daggered, peaceful Poland. I was born in the ocean away, not in Munich or Paris or Amsterdam or any other European city where the lurking Gestapo could have pulled me from a playpen or snatched me from the street, beat me, arm banded me with a profane star of David, reduced me to a tattooed number. Was I lucky to have been born too late to fight in the wretched war? As some might say consolingly, hell no. Knowing now this haunting half of my heritage, I just wish I had been one of the greatest generation. Thank you, Eugene, very good. Um, Eugene's going to be the opening poet, the warm-up poet for next month's reading, uh, the February reading. So, um, all right, uh, Jerry Chaplin. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I, I so enjoyed Tracy's presentation and um, Eugene, I was very touched by yours. I, I did lose family members in the Holocaust. So very beautiful and moving poem. Thank you. It's 
Good to see everybody as best we can see everybody tonight. Um, I'm reading a poem from my new book, Third Person Singular, which should be out next month or in March. I collaborated with two other poets. It's the first time I've ever done that. And um, we created 100 poems, 33 and a third each. Last July, my 10 and 12 year old grandsons came to visit us in Massachusetts from their home in Kansas. And the poem I'm about to read talks about that experience. Berkshire Summer. My grandson's laughter shrieks waterfalls down the walls of my summer house, usually quiet as a stone in sun. They are here to learn New England nature, to shelter salamanders in mud moistened hands, freedom in wild forests, pick blackberries on a mountaintop, reached on strong determined legs, turning tan as teak. Audubon's legacy has given them this sanctuary for fishing, ponding, streaming, hiking. They magnify the tiny legs of bugs, share sandwiches with new friends on untraveled, twisted trails. They catch sight of caterpillars on thick old trees, hardwoods, softwoods, gnarled knots, the primal rings of ages, trees rooted on a soft ferned floor, covering new earth, a collection of canopies. These boys, bouncy as boughs, so far from the flat plains of home, find life force here. They stand on land danced by Mohicans and hear the foreign songs of ancient birds, an awakening. These days will never happen again, singular as a bird in Audubon's eye. Thank you. I love that poem, Jerry, and um, you'll have to tell me for the newsletter when your um, third person singular comes out so I can uh, include it in the, the news. I will, thank you. Um, the, uh, many of you know me from uh, hosting the open mic, uh, Monday Night Poetry and Music for years, and uh, Jerry was the feature 10 years ago. We are just uh, sharing memories about that in pictures. Um, so, all right, um, Charles Watts, he is uh, one of our board members and he is largely responsible for getting us through all this Zoom stuff since we uh, were forced into starting it uh, for COVID. So Charles, take it away. Okay, we'll do uh, this, uh, this poem is called Lonely Road and it has an epigraph by uh, Kenneth Graham, The Wind in the Willows, <clears throat> quote, the road itself, when he reached it, in that loneliness that was everywhere, seemed like a strange dog to be looking anxiously for company. <clears throat> How goes your search for meaning in this ragged world of empty hallways and doors that keep closing as you pass? Of all the great books that put you to sleep, of all the people who forget your name, and then you see her dancing on the edge of mystery, pulling you beyond what might have been, pulling you into the void of love, of need, of letting go, pulling you into a life complete and unexpected. You stroll, jog, stumble, trudge, cross the road because the road is there, calling sometimes for you to walk alone in agony, calling sometimes for you to walk together into the light of day, calling sometimes for you to run through life like a dog runs across a shallow river, never looking down and never missing a step. Great one. Um, last, last month we were in person uh, for the first time in almost two years and Charles read for that and it was a, uh, I don't know, that was, that was an incredible poem you did that, Charles, um, that night, uh, a poem that you prepared for uh, Lake Placid for something to do with the, uh, something with the city. I forgot the exact reason. 
Oh, it was a uh, it was a group that uh, was put together from Vermont, New York, uh, Quebec, uh, city government agencies to uh, do an artistic <clears throat> reaction to the uh, pollution in the in the in the um, uh, Lake Champlain watershed. So it was kind of weird. Yeah, well, it was it was very memorable. Um, well, so one of the, I guess, benefits, if you can look at it that way, of having to go uh, Zoom tonight was that uh, Yvette was not going to be able to be at the Library Society in person, which I thought was a tragedy since she's one of our best poets, but she is, of course, here tonight by Zoom. So, um, uh, Yvette, you're, you're up next. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, <clears throat> I have with me tonight the poem in which words don't deserve this. They have been around a long time, served us well. Why then do we use them like poison blue darts? Words have been so kind as to adapt. They want to stay relevant too. But we spit them into red plastic cups like baca juice and leave them on the side of the road. They never harmed us, yet we turn them ugly side out, pit them against each other, use our fangs to inject venom. <clears throat> the poor words can't be unheard. The ring after of their scent make folk mad. I hope they don't cry. I hope they don't die by suicide. I hope they don't vanish within. Then we will never again find the words. They might like that though. Scrub clean with a different color hair. They can hold hands, stroll the streets, carry their shopping bags, or look for a bistro in peace. Thank you. That was great, Yvette. Thank you. I'm so glad that uh, you got to be part of this tonight. And I as well. I am glad that you're getting vaccinated too. That makes me very happy. So, all right. Well, um, we have next someone I asked for help in pronouncing your name. And then now I'm starting to doubt myself, but hopefully I'm going to say this right. Grace Priswara. Okay. That's it. You got it. Okay. <laughs> and I, I think I even pronounced it wrong because it's Polish. So it's, I mean, there's, there's no hope there. So, <laughs> but thank you. Uh, thank you for the, um, for the opportunity uh, for me to read my poems to someone other than um, my family. <laughs> so this, this is a treat. Um, tonight I have a study of ambulation and acoustics. Um, about when my, fun, my son first started walking, um, like every new parent, I think everything that my child does is worth writing a poem down. So, so here we are. While trying to describe the first steps of my son, I figure I should employ some onomatopoeia, but his feet don't go clomp, stomp, tip tap, or thud, or anything else I can think of off the top of my head. So I listened to the soft drum of my heel on the wood, the instant warm absorption of that sound into the grain, how the ball just barely whispers it's sticking as it lifts. It is a summer day in South Carolina after all. Pacing the living room and reeling off the alphabet, I wish we had more letters, but I decide on dum. It's too fast for any vowels and the B is not silent. And I like how it's symmetrical, D-M-B but his steps aren't so articulate. He doesn't have an arch yet. So maybe I'll come up with a different word for him once he goes a little longer, once he's had a little practice, once I can hear his little footfalls over pops of laughter. Thank you. I think, um, I think many a poet's edginess uh, was lost when they had kids and all of a sudden they started writing about, about their, um, what is her name? Uh, I'm not going to remember it now. She's a College of Charleston professor, and she was, she she uh, her poems were always uh, quite amazing. Well, like 
complex and then she then she started having kids and then it was all kids all the time um what was her i can't remember anyway um moving on thank you grace that was that was wonderful and i enjoyed onomatopoeia um tamara miles is a, a very valued member of our board and she is going to be reading next are you there? Hello, everyone. So my daughter's getting married on March the 5th, and I'm very happy about it. And I was thinking about her tonight. So this is a poem that I wrote for her, and it's called Nomads. In the night sky, Arab Sea, Al Awaid, the mother camels, a pattern of stars that seem to gather around the calf and protect her from hyenas. In the life before this one, daughter, I might have carried you for just over a year and delivered you to your first slow, searing desert breaths. A camel mare is the only mammal who does not clean her infant after birth, nor bite through the umbilical cord. Another cord binds me to you. It runs from brain stem to lumbar region with nerve roots, dorsal roots, ventral roots, the peripheral butterfly columns and the cauda equine horse's, horse's tail, motor supply for the perineum that brought you into light in late September, a desert sunflower, your eyes dolly blue to gift me my happiest autumn. A calf is born with eyes open. Did you know camels always face the sun? Their lovely long eyelashes and their tears protect their eyes from sand and grit and blindness. We were nomads in that other life. And maybe that is why I do not see you as much as I would like, but we are bound to each other nonetheless. And you will find me waiting in al Waid even at the dawn of my next life. Thank you. Are you going to read that poem at her wedding? If she would like for me to read a poem, <laughs> we'll see. I think you should do it whether she wants you to or not. OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Another of our esteemed board members, we have this, this year, since we're using Zoom, this is the first year that we have a really a good representation of board members around the state. And um, it's been, I think that's been a, one of the best things that, that's happened to us. Um, and Nancy Dew Taylor, you are up next. Are you still there? I'm gonna have to unmute. Um, down at the bottom of your, there should be like a little microphone that you click on, mute if you move your cursor on the left. Charles, is it possible to unmute Nancy from where you are? Oh, there How you about go. now? Yes. Okay, yep. great. Thanks. It's wonderful the variety of topics and methods that we use. I'm happy to be a part of this. Um, I'm working on a series of poems about the Cone Sisters of Baltimore and Blowing Rock, who amassed a huge collection of Matisse's and Picasso's um, and other Impressionist paintings in the early 1900s. Um, the younger sister, Etta, was a close friend of Leo and Gertrude Stein. And the older sister, Clarabelle, was a physician, an iconoclast, an independent thinker. And I'm going to read you a short poem about Clarabelle. The doctor of no patience explains her choice of profession. I love choosing a profession my acquaintances think as inappropriate as preaching. What an idiot Samuel Johnson was, though whom I could have said that to, 
who would appreciate it. I am smarter than all of them, certainly than most women, if my family is any indication, and definitely the equal of any man. Medicine it was then, and I not only finished well, I shone first in my medical class. Then reality struck. In my first job, I, like a patient, obeyed doctors' grunts, even brought low, brought teeth. And the patients, clerks, Turks, and shirkers were unclean, ignorant, incapable of following orders. We call them non-compliant. My talents, I realized, would best be recognized by experts, by equals, that is, by doctors and PhDs. So it's teaching and the pathology lab for me. Donning a smock as ugly as it is rubbery, I find my place at the head of the room or beside the microscope among minds equal to mine. <laughs> I really like the, uh, the line, as ugly as it is rubbery. <laughs> that was neat. Well, thank you, Nancy. Um, what was the name of that? Was that the doctor of no patience? Was that the title? Or was that the first line? Oh, you're gonna to have to unmute. The doctor of no patience explains her choice of profession is the title. Great title. Well, thank you, Nancy. You're muted now. Yeah, I see. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I should be an old for <laughs> this by now. Um, all right. Um, so John Byrne is the next reader. He is also on the board. Uh, he's been on the board for a couple of years now, and uh, he is a, another one of the behind the scenes people who keeps these Zoom meetings working well. So John. Thanks, Jim. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm going to read a little poem, kind of a Charleston poem. Let me see if I can find it. OK. Meeting Street. I'm walking the long way back to my car, passing houses built over a century ago. There's pig's blood in the plaster to make it pink, but I think I'm remembering that wrong. I'm listening to a song I used to drive to when things were already broken, but I still thought we could fix them. Earlier, after the art museum and the first closed coffee shop, I pointed out a straight couple, color coordinated down to the dog, and told Jay I would think about them for days. He was wearing shorts, but admitted it was colder out than he'd realized. I keep catching myself looking at his eyes and hoping I'll see something familiar something like home, but he's a stranger. This is what beginning is, tiptoeing around the obvious awkwardness, evading comments that seem too forward because I want to pretend there's something there. In texts, I've told him I want him to hold me, but at the art museum, I flinched when he touched my shoulder. I keep forgetting he's older. When the second coffee shop is closed for sale sign and all, we follow the straight line to the next closed shop and stop, considering the bent fork between our next two options. Someone told me recently to always go right, but we went left. The street smells like horse piss, and Jay comments on this, and all I can say is, that's Charleston for you. I have nothing to say. I had fun today. I mean, I think I had fun today. Right now, on the long walk back to my car, I'm appreciating how far my feet have carried me and how my face is blank because it has nothing to show. 
I wish I knew how to tell if it would be better to call things off before they get out of hand. Back home, Jay sends me pics from the gym and I send him pictures of my cat. Jay sticks his tongue out a lot. I wish he'd stop doing that. For every man I disappoint by not hooking up, there's another I let down by not wanting to date. This is how I mark my progress. Today, I left the house. Thanks. Wow, thanks, John. That was great. So they did use um, blood for the stucco. It was usually cow's blood. <laughs> Just so you know. Um, it was a, it, they, they, they added additives to try to make the line set up faster um, than it normally would. So they put, they, in, in fact, they used um, cow's urine, um, blood, and anything else. They, there's some um, clays that helped it work too. Just in case, uh, in case you wanted to know, but you already said you might have gotten it wrong. <laughs> anyway, that was a great poem. Thank you. Um, so last month, I got to meet William Winslow for the first time, and he has signed up for the open mic. So let's see, are you still with, you are there, you'll need to unmute, and looking forward to hearing your poem. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, as Jim mentioned, I'm William Winslow, live in Mount Pleasant. In February, uh, September of last year, I was my first book of poetry. I mean to be self-serving here. And uh, anyway, the title of the poem is Invitation to an Old Friend. Most of my poems are autobiographical and they're also many of them are about the dogs that we've had over the years. And, uh, do you hear okay, Jim? Do you hear okay? Okay, uh, we're hearing you. It, it seems to be coming in and out. So if you maintain a, a uniform distance to your microphone, I think that might help. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Uh, the title uh, is Invitation to an Old Friend. That sound okay? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead and okay. read it. Okay, uh, invitation to an old friend. Come spend a small corner of October with me for the first snowfall when I'll have to drain the pipes and shutter it all up for the season. No need for the wives. Mine is ailing with a bad back, an angry colon. Yours is having memory issues. I'll have my stent with me. You can bring your bovine valve. And I'm certain there are other things going on inside us. We'll learn about soon enough. We are lucky and the moisture is just right. Colors will be glorious. There will be a chill in the air and a temporary excitement about things that we are not sure of and won't be able to sustain. And it will pass. Pack at least one sweater and bring your dog. Don't tell me you have work at home. Grass has stopped growing there and the gutter is not yet filling up with leaves. I had to take down the white pine but you can really see the mountain now. You can sit out on the deck, have a glass of wine, talk and not talk. Thank you. Thank you, William. I really enjoyed that. Now, that is a, a, a beautiful poem. I recently was visited by my father um, uh, last week. And, um, and so the, all those signs of age are very uh, poignant. I very much so. Um, okay, um, so uh, that's all we had for the original list. I was a little bit disappointed we didn't get more people replying to the email, but we've since then we've got um, three more signed up, and so I'm very glad that uh, Deborah Connor can read. She's up next. Good evening, everyone. For some months now, I've been working on a series of poems, persona poems, in the voices of uh, Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, alternating voices, and um, also in the voices of a few people who were in the circle of their lives. 
I've worked my way now into uh, the year 1930, and this is a new poem that um, is set when Zelda has her first breakdown and is hospitalized in Neon, Switzerland. It's titled Zelda Prejean Clinic, Neon, Switzerland, October 1930. There is a lake here, the color of slate, and a mated pair of white swans that chase the patients who ignore the nurse's warnings and wander close. The nurses don't know I stuff my pockets with the remains of my sandwich and vanish into the rain past the row of pines to the water's edge. For now, I'm allowed no visitors, but Scott sends flowers that quickly wither and short notes on paper the color of the doctor's smock. To him, I write long letters on paper embossed with my name. I repeat the word dear many times. Once I filled a whole page with just that word. Dear, I whisper to coax the swans closer, but they are wary. They gobble the crusts I offer, then retreat down the bank, leaving feathers embedded in the mud. Dear, I say as they glide away, oh dear. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. The, um, it, it reminds me of the, uh, the first, the Poetry Society at first was the, the Jazz Age, um, beginning in 1921. And uh, Josephine Pinckney was almost the same age as F. Scott Fitzgerald. She was one of the founders of the Poetry Society. And you wouldn't believe how often World War I comes up in, the, in my book, because so many of the people who read for the Poetry Society or remembers were in World War I. I think that that war very much uh, had a, a large effect on the early poetry society. Um, all right, well, thanks. I'm glad that you got to read. You've um, found such a wonderful poem for us. Um, Peggy Pearl, she is our next volunteer. Still with us? You're gonna have to unmute. Hello, I'm Peggy Pearl. This is an ABC Darien poem. Apples were the fruit I loved best when I was little. Apple butter was good on toast and apple crisp with ice cream delighted my family. Donuts with apple cider were good to eat for a fine fall treat at the orchard. We'd go each year and David would climb high and hand apples to me. I would just put them gently in the wicker basket and he kept picking. Later at home, we'd put them in our aluminum camping cooler. Mom found that apples stayed cool in our garage and would never freeze because of the cooler's thick insulated walls. Often when I wanted to study, I'd go get an apple or two to put on my desk, quite consciously copying a room I'd seen in a dollhouse at the Smithsonian Institute, where a tiny student had two miniature apples on her desk next to the lamp, one uneaten and one with a small bite out of it. I valued that example of how to study, wanting to be a model student myself. I tried to be exceptionally devoted to my work, yet I liked a snack ready. I took pleasure in the Zen simplicity of an apple awaiting. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Peggy. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people are thinking of eating an apple right now? <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> 
So I'm glad you got to uh, to read that for us, Peggy. Are there any other? So that's um, that's who I had on the list, but uh, we have time for more. So who, if anyone wants to um, read, you have a poem for us. Um, can you either uh, like put something in the chat or um, unmute yourself and just say hello and that you have a poem? Anyone? Anyone? I'll read another one. Um, okay. This is called Nexus. Oh, okay. go ahead. Okay. The day the corpse flower began to bloom in Tucson, a caravan of African elephants at Amoseli went on nighttime safari. Deep in the dark, a 200 pound calf came calling from his mother's thighs. A boy, hairy, short trunked, ears like small continents, pachydermos, milk teeth, must, milk teeth tusks in a diamond pattern, lustrous. A herd of low grumbles made a late melody. At dawn, the grazer browsers look for breakfast in the bush. Mount Kilimanjaro at their backs, dry legs looming, their trunks teased leaves towards their mouth, and all the while back at the zoo in Arizona, the corpse flower unrolled itself slowly for hours. Red blossom opening before onlookers, cameras clutched, an eye remote viewer watched the birth live online. Where's the nexus between the now that flowers and the land of elephants in my mind, waiting for the first day's taste held in the fibrous tunic of my own mammalian eye, fastened on an elephant carcass, bones baked by the midday sun. Hmm. Thanks. Well, Tamara, you're taking us all over the world tonight. We were in, the <laughs> middle, in, our, in our Africa. Um, so I don't know if everyone knows this, but Tamara is featured in a series of videos about the early history of the Poetry Society. If you go to our YouTube channel, which is just called the Poetry Society of South Carolina. Um, there are 11 very short videos um, about the various founders of the Poetry Society, some of the interesting stuff that occurred, all uh, narrated by Tamara's incomparable voice. So check those out. Um, all right, so I saw that Yvette wanted to read a second one. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Robert, I see you're raising your hand. We'll get we'll get you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I will. We'll get, we'll get you after a vet. This poem is called Accents, and it's after a work by a wonderful spoken word poet named Denise Froman. <clears throat> Accents, sister, my mama has the sky in her mouth too. She carries beautiful Hausa, rhythmic Igbo, and exquisite Yoruba, all smashed into one gumbo called Gullah. Gullah, the language of survival. In muck of rice fields and muck of this republic, it flows with a rhythm so deep, deep, deep. It has to be eaten like all good gumbo should with cornbread. We know that the beauty of this Creole is living on nothing, thriving in mist, governed by the moon itself, gullah pounds the shore like the tide, dragging grains of sand to build islands elsewhere. Hidden deep within our throats, language of rebellion seen in the eyes, heard in the tilt of a chin. My mama brought it to me with the pride of bare feet. We are yet being used, bought, sold, traded, packed, shipped, and pilfered. For now, poachers take gullah like ivory and put her on their trinkets to sell. Thank you. 
Thank you. That was that was great. As always, I haven't heard you read a bad poem yet. Um, and I. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. So Robert, you want you have a poem? Where where'd you go? I'm here. Okay. <clears throat> So it's called Finding My Place. The Art Student League, New York City, famous artists O'Keefe, Pollock, Rauschenberg walk to these halls, thumbing breathlessly, glossy catalog in hand, searching for a mentor, finding Henry. Color is my concern, light and color as feeling. I also look for rhythm, how one image leads to another. His portfolios show that a pine tree can be framed by dark green with ultramarine purple borders. Yards come alive with brown and orange dabs of color. Class one, knapsack full, pads and arm, paints heavy, bulging, brushes poke with possibilities. Metro card won't scan, commuters give unwanted advice, cute train long gone, damn it. Arrived late at 57th and 7th, bounded up the stairs. The monitor, official apron and clipboard, thin-lipped, go to any open easel. Only one space with an awful side view of life model, can't get focused. Unsanctioned walkabout. I observe the work of others, palettes with careful dabs of color like space, jewels in a tennis bracelet, a mixing space reserved for alchemy, Brushes wiped clean, wands of practical magic, carefully crafted lines conspire to capture contour. Sad contrast, my, pile, my palette, piles of primary colors, too raw, old brushstrokes full of regret, brush tips muddy with neglect, desperation. I paint the surrounding spaces with green and work in. Suddenly a body emerges making rounds, Henry, with playful green eyes. You are starting with a negative space. Great. Good one. Are you, I notice all the art behind you. Are you the artist? Yes, I picked this up three or four years ago. And now that I'm in Charleston six months, I built a studio in my garage and I'm, I'm at it. All right. It looks good from here. It's like you, you got you got uh, a style. That's neat. Thank you. Um, glad you could read. What about anyone else? Um, could just Eugene. Would you like you'd like to read a second one? You're gonna have to unmute. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Since you have a little excess time, I would like to read an old poem. I was inspired by this scene of my daughter sleeping in her crib when she was an infant. It's titled New Priorities. My preoccupation is no longer empires. I tiptoe in darkness to witness your blankets rise and fall. Then Bending over the slats of your crib that remain silent centuries through the night, I become reacquainted with the God I knew in my youth and say a wordless prayer of hope for your future, which is the future of all the world, while listening for the sweetest sound I have ever heard, your breathing. Thanks, it caught me off guard. It was, it, that was quick. Um, great poem. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Um, so, yes. Charles? It is I, Charles. All right. I, I thought I ought to read a poem that no, no poet had ever written about, the subject matter that no poet had ever written about. So I decided to take on love and death. <laughs> It's called When I Grow. When I grow, I want to be a tree trunk, fallen in the forest, 
covered in mushrooms and lichen when I grow into death. A meadow just before mowing, pushing new flowers into the sun. I want to be reborn as a 91-year-old woman who can no longer remember her joys and sorrows. I want to be her epiphany of memory, reliving it all for her when the rain begins to fall. I want to fall into the sea, burned out, Icarus in a final descent, laughing as I realize the follies that held me in the sky, the ashes of a volcano fertilizing the crops of earth. I do not wish to be reborn as an eye separated from thou. Let there be only renunciation of all that tears us apart. Let there be only acceptance that too does not exist. Hmm. Well, those might be uh, well-worn uh, topics for poets, but uh, you always find a way to, to say it all brand new again. So thank you, Charles. Um, so Rob, I, I take it by your hand that you want to read a poem. Uh, actually, I don't. <laughs> okay. But yeah, but I'll get into that in a second. The reason I'm here is because Eugene discovered a few months ago that he had family he didn't know about, and it turns out we're cousins, so which has been a real treat. <laughs> but um, but actually, I I was a I'm retired now, but I was a journalist for um, over about 46 years or something like that. And uh, but I was looking at some of the stuff I've written on my computer in front of me, and I wrote stories about some poets. <laughs> And these were usually children though, or kids. And I met a girl, yeah, I met a girl named Anna, who um, this, I wrote this about 10 years ago, but basically, um, you know, she, you know, she you know, really was a, you know, just a writer. But then at some point when she was still a teenager, she became a, you know, she got more into poetry. And I'd really like to see if I can, find her parents and see what she's doing 20, you know, 10 years later. And she'd be close to 40 by now, I guess, 30, I mean. But she, um, you know, let's see. Oh, shoot, what I do with it? Um, basically, she just, uh, you know, she just really, you know, but she says, I guess she wrote it, this is what she said 10 years ago, that I don't write because I want to say something to other people she wrote in a scholarship application, which she won. But she says, I write because I have something to say to myself and turn it over until it makes some semblance of sense, until it teaches me something about my own life or the world around me. So, which was, she was really neat. I just wish I remember doing the article, <laughs> but, uh, but I'll try and track that down. Wow. So that's been, that's been fun for me is to write about other people. Not yeah. so much myself. Good. Well, thanks for um, thanks for adding that to our night. Um, uh, Randy, you uh, you want to read? Yeah, let me tr let me try. I, I know I canceled out because I'm so hoarse, but um, I'll tr I'll try here at the last minute. <clears throat> the the poem I'm going to read is called is entitled Monday, 23 September, 1940. And what it is, is a, a, uh, a pretend in entry into Virginia Woolf's journals. And um, it does, it, it reflects what actually was going on, but it's not something she wrote about. Um, this morning, when I was in the garden with Nessa, I thought I felt drops of rain. Is there a specific sensation for wetness? Something other than touch or cool? The drops felt small as pinpricks, painless against my bare neck. Nothing I could see was falling from the sky and neither of us had disturbed the dew on the climbing rose. Times like those caused me to, caused me to wonder if ever so imperceptibly I'm drowning. It has been a year since the first air raid siren sounded and I feel an awful closeness to death. I'm alone for an hour now. I have time to write. This is the anniversary of his death. I think the princess and a few others have decided to gather and mark it. 
but we won't participate. I have become too much caught up in reading his work than disturbed by it. Freud, I fear, is an acquired taste, one I can't expunge, a foreign wine. He swirls about in my head and sits on my tongue as though his words were my own. I have that same feeling over and over. Last year, I compared it to being in a whirlpool, but what, I wonder, has kept me afloat against this awful pressure pulling me under, when even now I can feel my feet dangling in the void. What I wish is that I had begun to read him earlier. Then when we met, I could have questioned him, not waited for his thoughts to strike against me with such weight. Things that, which upset me more now that he is gone and I can say nothing. When I mentioned all this to Nessa, she reacted as though it was only a bit of silliness on my part and began to prune the Zephyrines. Um, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Randy. And, you can sound too it, well. it, is, it is true that Virginia Woolf did have a visit with Sigmund Freud, and that's, that's what's referred to at one point in the poem. That was great, thank you. I'm glad you could uh, you could read after all. Um, so we're uh, we are at, at the end, and I, um, oh, it's my my clock is chiming. Um, Sarantha, who um, met, some of you will remember, in um, back in the when I ran the open mic at the East Bay Meeting House, uh, Sarantha would start every night. Well, anytime she was there, she would bring her flute and start the night. And um, so she asked if she could do that tonight. And, and we're going to have we're going to end with that. We'll almost end with that because Sarantha is going to play. And then I've got a little special surprise for you. So Sarantha, you'll have to unmute yourself. Down at the lower left, something that looks like a microphone, you click on it. Okay. <clears throat> Jim, I brought your favorite. Can you hear me? Thanks, Sarantha. That brought back um, wonderful memories of all those years that we uh, we met at East Bay Meeting House uh, on Monday nights. Um, I'm glad we could fit that in at the end. I so I have uh, what we will go out on since this is our anniversary. In fact, tomorrow is January 15th. That is one hundred and year one hundred and one years ago tomorrow. Uh, was the first meeting of the Poetry Society at Society Hall. And um, I have with me the 1921 yearbook. Um, 
that I am going to read a poem out of. I had to look pretty hard through it to find one that was uh, halfway decent, but um, I thought it's kind of beautiful for tonight. And um, so I'm gonna read it to you. It's by um, Janie Screven Hayward, who is DeBose Hayward's mother. And um, she was a good poet in her own right, kind of famous in her time. And um, this one is probably among her best. It's called, Give Me Your Stars to Hold. Give me your stars to hold, love as you gain them. Stars from the faraway sky, lonely I must be that you may attain them. Lonely yet proud, prideful am I. Give me your stars to hold, daily I tell them, feast on their shimmering gold in my hand. Joy is in parting, which makes me the keeper of stars from a faraway land. Give me your stars to hold, stop not to count them, lest you may fall upon sleep. Gemmed is the circlet, love I will fashion of stars which you give me to keep. So a poem from 101 years ago to uh, tomorrow, um, the beginning of our wonderful poetry society and uh, we're still going and we are in the future, we're living in the future, a future they never could have imagined. And it's, uh, it, it makes me feel good that we could still be here uh, today and we'll continue on. So. Our next meeting will be in February. It will be virtual. The poet who's reading that night decided she was not gonna take the risk to travel during COVID time. So that'll be virtual. And as of now, our March meeting is going to um, take place in person if you, uh, at the Library Society. If you cannot be there for, because of distance or any other reason, you can join us by Zoom. So we'll be, it'll be both ways. So uh, I think it was a wonderful night. We ended up having 20, um, uh, well, 19 poems and one flute solo. So that was 20 um, presentations, which I had asked, I, that was my original goal is to have 20 sign up on the list. And um, so we did that. And I think it was really a nice night. And I wanna thank everybody who have participated and, and every, everyone who could be here tonight. So it was, it was another great night. And this is uh, the first meeting of our new, of 2022. So we're starting a new new year. I hope this cheers. ends up better than the last couple. So, yep, cheers. Tara's to... All right, well, thank you. And we're gonna, I'm gonna stop the recording now. You wanna stick around and chat? You're welcome to.